All right, everyone, welcome this week to this quarter's last Zoom for Thought talk. We're going to have uh, Tani finishing us out strong by telling us about quiver representations, Gabriel's theorem, and the Morita equivalence. Take it away. Cool. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, here's what I'm going to talk about today. It's just a little outline. So first, um, I'll give some definitions of what is a quiver, what is a representation of a quiver, um, and I'll give some examples of those. Um, and then I'll talk about one of the main theorems um, about quiver representations, which is called Gabriel's theorem. And then at the end, um, I'll talk about sort of an alternative perspective on uh, quivers and their representations that comes from this thing called the path algebra. So I'll just get right into it. So what is a quiver? Um, so a quiver, we usually call it Q. It's this ordered tuple, so Q0, Q1, S, T. Um, and it's a uh, directed graph where Q0, so Q0 is the set of nodes, vertices. Uh, Q1 is the set of edges or arrows. And S and T are functions. So S and T are functions from Q1 to Q0 that take an arrow basically to its source and target respectively. So take an arrow to its source and target. Um, so I'll give an example on the next slide, but just before that, I'll give uh, another quick definition. We say Q is finite uh, if the set of nodes and the set of arrows are both finite. So Q0 and Q1 are finite. And then one more thing to notice is that there's really nothing special about this definition. Um, it is just a directed graph. Um, so that's how you should think about quivers, just directed graphs. and. The reason why we use the word quiver is because we're talking about uh, representation theory, usually. Um, so I'll give an example. So here's a couple of examples of quivers. Um, the, on this top, this top one, the blue one, I have three vertices or nodes. I labeled them one, two, and three. And then I have a bunch of arrows um, that you can see. So the arrows I labeled with like alphas, alpha one through alpha four. Um, and I can just give an example of like these functions. So S of alpha three in this case is gonna be the source of this alpha three arrow. So that'll be node three. Um, whereas like S of alpha four is gonna be equal to T of alpha four, which is gonna be this uh, also this three, three node. Um, so you can have loops in this case. Um, and then in orange, I have another example where I have um, four vertices, three arrows, and just in case anyone wants to see this, I have source of uh, beta two in this case is just four and the tail of, for example, beta two is two. Um, cool, so does anyone have any questions about like what is a quiver and uh, or these examples or the definition? Yeah. So to clarify two things, one, can we have multiple like repeated arcs? Um, yep. And also, can we have them going both ways? Yes, so those are good questions. Yes, you can have both of those things. Um, there's really no, uh, no constraints on these quivers. Um, so for, for example, I can just add an arrow here, um, like call it beta four. And so yeah, it can go both. You can have an arrow going between two vertices, and then another arrow going in the opposite direction. Um, and yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. And then, yeah, and then, and then furthermore, yeah, you can have like a third arrow that's also going that way. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, cool, good question. Um, so let's go on to talk about what is a representation of a quiver. So a representation of a quiver, we'll usually call it M. Uh, Representation M of Q is, well, it's two things. 
First, it's a C vector space. So actually, I should clarify, I'm going to talk about C representations in this talk. So a C vector space, so I'll call it MI associated to each node I. And then secondly, it's a C linear map um, associated to each, so we'll call it phi alpha from MI to MJ for each alpha, for each alpha in Q1 with S of alpha equals I and T of alpha equals J. Um, and then another quick definition before I give an example of this is called the dimension vector. So the dimension vector of, rep of a representation is just the ordered tuple of the dimensions of each of the vector spaces. So the ordered tuple uh, dimension MI where these are indexed by the, the vertices. So here's an example. So say we have this quiver on the left. Uh, it's uh, these four nodes with arrows each pointing inward. Um, then an example of a representation of this quiver would be this thing M on the right, uh, where I've assigned the vector space C to each of the like outermost nodes, and then the vector space C2 to the middle one. And then I've assigned these matrices to the arrows. So you can view the linear transformations as these matrices. Um, so there's my example. And then once we talk about representations of quivers, we also want to talk about what is a morphism uh, between two representations. So I'll define that here. So a morphism of quiver representation, so I'll call it like capital phi from M to N, uh, is going to be a collection of linear maps. So it's a collection of linear maps, capital phi I, going from MI to NI. By the way, um, I should clarify for if you're talking about morphisms between two quiver representations, then you you are fixing fix your initial quiver. So fix a quiver Q. Um, just so we don't get confused. You I, I I'm not sure if there's like a notion of morphisms between quiver representations when the quiver is actually changing. <laughs> um, but here we're just fixing a quiver Q and then we're talking about morphisms of a fixed quiver. So phi, phi i from mi to ni, uh, such that uh, for each arrow, for each arrow alpha, which goes from say i to j in q, this diagram, so draw this diagram, we have mi to mj, and this is say some map phi alpha. Um, and then these maps here are going to be phi i and phi j. And then we have ni and nj in our other representation. And then call this maybe psi alpha. And we want this diagram to commute. So that's um, given two representations. That's what it means to have a morphism between them. And so I can give an example of that as well. Or before I give an example, I'll, I'll talk about sub-representations using this, this notion. And I'll give some examples of that. So if phi from M to N is a morphism of quiver representations, uh, and we have phi I injective. So phi I from MI to NI injective for each I. Then M is called a sub-representation. So injective, then M is called sub-representation. So now I'll give an example and a non-example, a sub-representation of n. So say we have a quiver, q is just, say it's this dot and then an arrow and then a dot. Then an example would be, we take m to be uh, zero mapping to c, and then we take n to be c mapping to c with an identity map or an isomorphism. And then here is say we have the identity map. And then here, this has to be the zero map. 
So here M is gonna be a sub-representation of N, um, but a very similar looking example, I can call it M prime with C mapping to zero and then N being the same, same thing as before, C mapping to C via one. Uh, if I try to make this some isomorphism, some injective map from C to C, uh, there's actually no way for this diagram to commute. So in other words, this is a non-example. So like M prime is not a sub-representation of N in this case. Um, and I think this is, this is kind of the simplest case where you have something that's maybe a, like more complicated than just vector spaces. Um, because obviously like C is a, vector, is a vector subspace of C and zero is a vector subspace of C, but this quiver is not, or this representation is not a sub-representation of the one on the bottom. So um, there's my example. And then another definition is direct sum. So the representation M direct sum N, it's kind of exactly what you would think. So it's given by, given by M direct sum N. So the vector space at I is just the sum of the vector spaces, direct sum. And the arrow or the, the transformation at the arrow alpha is given by, I'll just call it phi sub M plus N at alpha. Well, it's gonna be phi at M. It's gonna be the direct sum of the two maps. So phi, at, phi of M at alpha plus phi at N of alpha. Um, so concretely, if we have uh, the same quiver and we have this representation C mapping to C and I take the direct sum of say like C mapping to zero, uh, then this is just gonna give me a representation that looks like C2 mapping to C via one zero. So yeah, there's a, a bunch of definitions and an example. Um, does anyone have any questions up to this point? Uh, I had a quick question when you were defining like the dim, uh, the dimension vector or something. Yeah. Uh, you said it was an ordered tuple. Am I, are we supposed to just take like Q0 here to have like any order? Yeah, um, so that's a good question. In general, we'll take Q0 to just be like, well, we'll be dealing with like finite, um, finite quivers and we'll just take Q0 to be like one to N. Uh, so it doesn't really matter like what the order is on Q0? Yeah, I mean, you'll get a different dimension vector with like a different labeling, oh. but okay. um, yeah, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, I was just wondering if like it usually, to do with the arrows at all. No, it has nothing to do with the arrows. It's just like a choice okay. that you make when you when you have your initial quiver. So like, I can look at my quiver and like label the arrows one, two, and three in that order, um, mm -hmm. but I also don't have to. Um, so like. Okay. Yeah, if I label them in this order and then I have like C2, C3, C4, then my dimension vector is going to be two, three, four. Um, but it's, this is sort of all a convention. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Okay. So I will move on. So here's some more definitions for uh, irreducible and indecomposable. So these are, these are some definitions that sort of hold whenever you're talking about representation theory. Um, so what is a simple representation? So a representation is called simple if uh, it has no sub-representations. So I'll just abbreviate sub-reps there. And for example, this is a simple representation zero to C. Again, I'm using the same quiver, which is just dot arrow dot. Um, and for example, C mapping to C with a one here. So if this is like the identity map, this is not simple because as we saw on the previous slide, it had a sub-representation. So a very similar looking definition um, that turns out to be pretty different in general is what we say a representation is called indecomposable. If it cannot be written as a direct sum, 
let's say a direct sum of two sub-representations. So for example, um, something that's indecomposable but not simple is the example I had above. So C mapping to C with the identity map. Um, and in particular, this thing that we saw in the previous slide, C, C to zero is not a sub-representation. And so if you try to write down, say, you know, this, if you try to write down this thing as a direct sum of two sub-representations, well, you have to have, uh, in order to be a proper sub-representation, you have to have dimension zero in one of the two places. So for example, zero to C is a sub-representation, but then this other one's C to zero is not. So there's nothing I can do basically to write down this one as a direct sum. Um, so there's the, the definition of those things. Um, and then we have some, a very nice little characterization of simple representation. So I think from, from this point forward, at least until I get through Gabriel's theorem, I'll be talking about Q uh, without directed cycles. So actually I'll, I'll just make that part of the proposition. So if Q has no directed cycles, then the only simple representations of Q are, well, they have to have two properties. They have to be non-zero of dimension one at one vertex. Oh, by the way, um, we, we, we consider the zero representation to not be simple. Like when we're talking about simple representations, uh, a representation is called simple if it has no subreps and it's non-zero. Non -zero. So uh, a simple representation should be non-zero of dimension one at at least one vertex. So we're gonna say it's, the, the proposition is that any simple representation is non-zero of dimension one at exactly one vertex and it's zero everywhere else. So for example, I can just give you a very simple example. Uh, if I have this as a representation of a quiver, then this is simple. And in fact, all representations of this quiver, so just with four dots and arrows going this way, um, all simple representations of this quiver are basic, basically look like this. They have a C at one place and zeros everywhere else. And then the natural question to ask once you know this um, is sort of what, what can we say that's similar about indecomposable representations? It turns out to be a much harder question. Um, and that's actually what Gabriel's theorem is, is all about. So I'll get to that. Um, and before that, I'll just give a quick definition. So we say a quiver Q is of finite type if it has finitely many isomorphism classes of indecomposable representations. And so I didn't define um, an isomorphism of quiver representations, but it's kind of exactly what you would think it is. Um, you can just think of it as, you know, the, the morphism at each place, so phi i from mi to ni is an isomorphism. Um, so what we're saying here is that a quiver Q is of finite type if it has finitely many isomorphism classes of indecomposable representations. And then the theorem, which was by Gabriel and it's from 1972, is that a quiver Q is of finite type uh, if and only if if and only if the underlying graph of Q is one of the following. So it is a complete classification. 
And so I drew, I drew the, these, uh, these graphs down here. And by the way, when I say a quiver Q is a finite, I, I talk about the underlying graph of Q. I just mean like take the quiver Q and ignore the orientation of the, of the arrows and you get, you get a graph, just a normal graph. Um, and it has to be one of these. So the first one I have is called a n. It's just n vertices in a row. Um, and then there we have d n, which is n minus one vertices in a row plus one vertex um, at the second to last one, like coming down at the second to last one. And then we have these these three other ones that are kind of they're not infinite families. They're just uh, just examples of graphs. It's what one is called e six. It's just these six vertices and these uh, edges between them. And then we have E7 and E8, which are, you just get from E6 by extending it by one. Um, and there's a word for these graphs. We say that Q is of Dinkin type A, D, or E. Yeah, because those are, that, th those are basically, these are called Dinkin diagrams and these are, um, yeah, that's the name for these graphs. And they, if anyone like already does representation theory, like you, you will have seen these before. Um, sorry, was there a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, can you so the finite type when you when you say yeah, can you go back to the definition? Yeah. So uh, when you are saying isomorphism, so finitely many isomorphism classes, you are taking equivalence of the isomorphism. Yeah. Exactly. So like, That's right. so for example, if you take a quiver of single point with uh, say C2 on it, then that's a finite type, right? I mean, mm. do you consider that as finite type or only C has to be finite type? So the quiver is gonna be finite type. So the quiver is just sort of, in that case, it would just be a single dot. Okay. Ah, it has, okay. Does that make sense? And then the, the rep like the the isomorphism class of indecomposable uh, okay, okay, of, yeah, no, no, yeah, it, yeah okay cool thanks yeah um in this case it will just be like the representation will just be c um at that vertex um yeah that's a good question does anyone have any other questions about this stuff or anything i've talked about so far Okay, nice. So we can move on. So now I'll, I'll basically- Sorry, one question. Yeah. Uh, I know you're staying away from anything other than C, but just briefly, is there a classification if you work in a different field than C? Yeah. Um, okay, so this definitely is like exactly the same if you work in any algebraically closed field. Um, sure. And I'm honestly not entirely sure if it's exactly the same, if your field is not algebraically closed. Okay, um, that's fine, thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I should clarify that the only reason I'm talking about C is to like keep the talk relatively simple, but I, I could have just used like K. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll keep going and then just feel free to also interrupt um, and ask questions. Um, so yeah, here's, I'm gonna talk about some ideas that go into the proof and also um, some notions about uh, quivers and stuff that will lead us to actually an even stronger theorem than the one I've stated uh, up to now. So we're gonna define this quadratic form associated to a quiver. Um, so we define Q from Zn to Z um, and Q of X, so X is now like a vector in Zn um, and it's just gonna be this. So gonna be the sum over i and q0, xi squared, minus the sum over alpha and q1 of x, uh, s of alpha, x, t of alpha. So for example, if you have this quiver, which is like one, two, three with arrows, and actually you can see that this uh, quadratic form doesn't even depend on the orientation of the arrows, it just depends on the underlying graph then this, um, maybe I should write it as Q of X1, X2, X3, 
is going to be x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared minus x1, x2 minus x2, x3. Um, and then there's a bunch of definitions you can give about quadratic forms in general. So we say a quadratic form Q uh, is positive semi-definite, positive semi-definite. Oops. If Q of X is greater than or equal to zero for all X. Um, and then the lemma about um, these quadratic forms that you get from a quiver is that, well, Q is positive semi-definite. <laughs> um, that's the lemma. Um, so if Q for, for any quiver, I guess my notation is a little confusing, but this is like the a definition for a general quadratic form. And then the lemma is that this basically holds for any quiver. Um, and then furthermore, we have another, another definition, which is that Q is positive definite. If Q of X is greater than zero for X not equal to zero. And then the lemma there is that Q is actually positive definite. Now we're talking about quivers in this case, Q is positive definite if and only if the, the underlying or the, the original quiver Q is of Dinkin type A, D, or E. Um, cool. So I realize actually my notation for, for this section is slightly confusing because I'm using Q over and over. And the lemmas, I just mean uh, that our little Q comes from a quiver, capital Q. Um, yeah, so, so those are the results. And furthermore, when you, whenever you have a quadratic form, you can talk about these things called roots um, or real roots. Um, so I think the, the notation or the term root is actually a little confusing in this case as well, but the definition is a real root of a positive semi-definite quadratic form is basically, it's a vector or just an element x in Zn with q of x equal to one. And so the lemma is that if q is of Dinkin type A, D, or E, A, D, E. Then the quadratic form Q has finitely many real roots. Um, and then um, sort of a, a way, another helpful thing that helps us think about these real roots is that well, there's another lemma, which is that each root is either called positive or negative. So each root either has all coordinates greater than or equal to zero. In that case, it's called a positive root or less than or equal to zero. In that case, it's called a negative root. Um, and so something good about these, these Dinkin diagrams is that, well, th there's only a few of them basically. So given a Dinkin diagram, you can sort of just compute at least for, for the AN and DN, you can compute what this Q is gonna be, what this quadratic form is gonna be. And then for the E6, E7, E8, and E8, you can also compute. Um, and so we can, Basically, the point is that we can write down all the, and I'll just say positive roots in each case. So I won't write I, I won't write them all down, but it is something that's not too hard to do, like just looking at the graphs. Um, and 
then sort of combining all of these lemmas and um, into a, a new theorem, uh, sort of a, almost a stronger result, we get this Gabriel's theorem part two, which is that if Q is of Dinkin type, A, D, or E, then actually the, the thing we talked about before, this dimension vector, induces a bijection. And I'll call it psi from the set of isomorphism classes of indecomposable representations. Isomorphism classes of indecomposable representations of Q to the set of positive roots of that quadratic form Q, uh, say positive roots of Q. So here's an example. Uh, if we take the quiver D4, um, say I give it this orientation, which is just um, all the arrows pointing inward towards the center vertex. Well then uh, you can actually sort of, you can give an, an argument for what are all of the indecomposable representations of this quiver um, that's like totally independent of Gabriel's theorem. Um, and so you can write them all down and here, here they are. Um, so if you look at like the first row, you can see that all the, all the ones in the first row are, are simple. They're all just dimension one and there's zero everywhere else. Um, but then the ones in the second row and third row are all sort of not simple, but are indecomposable. Um, and just using this, uh, Theorem, or at least to illustrate this theorem, I'll, I'll give an example on the next page of, if we start with D4, well, we can write down our quadratic form. It's gonna be X1 squared plus X2 squared, plus X3 squared plus X4 squared minus, oh, I should label the vertices actually. Um, so I'll just write it first. X1, X2 minus X2, X3 minus X2, X4. And I guess in this case, my my central vertex is two, and then my other vertices I've labeled like this. Um, and uh, if you look at, for example, one of the indecomposable representations that I had on the previous page, I, I just took this one, it's like the, the last one. Um, this will correspond to, well, what's its dimension vector? So its dimension vector is gonna be one, two, one, one. And then I wanna, just confirm that if I plug that into my quadratic form, I should get, it should be a root. And that means that I should output one. Um, so if I plug that in, I get one squared plus two squared, plus one squared plus one squared, minus one times two, minus two times one, minus two times one. And yeah, that works. So it's just kind of a cool example that Gabriel's theorem actually does work. Um, <laughs> I didn't prove anything, but <laughs> I gave an example. Um, so yeah, I think that's most of what I wanted to say about Gabriel's theorem. And I maybe I'll pause, see if anyone has any questions about the things I've said. At, at least like the way that you uh, explain this, like the quadratic form doesn't depend on the directionality of, of like your directed graph, right? And like you yeah. end up getting the pot, like the roots are the roots. So uh, I guess like, why do we consider directed graphs if like they're gonna, if you switch some of the directions, it should in essence still be classified in a, like this, like with the same way. So what, what, why yeah. is directed graph a, a good idea? Um, let's see. So I think you make a very good point, which is that like we, can classify like the indecomposable representations of like any Dinkin quiver. Um, and it doesn't depend on the orientation of the arrows. Um, and I guess what I wanna say is like, like the, the point of the result is that it's, it's pretty strong in that sense. Like, the point of the result is that like we have this very general class of like um, 
uh, objects, which are like quiver representations, which like have this specific structure, which is like given by, you know, um, vector spaces with arrows between them and stuff and like linear maps between them. And then we have this, it, it's almost like a, it's like a strong result. Like it's like a <laughs> powerful result. Um, so, but I feel like the question is like, why do we care about um, the directions in general? Well, I think, I mean, there, there's something that's true, which is that this is an if and only if result. So like, if you have a quiver that's not a Dinkin quiver, well then you're gonna have like indecomposable representation. You're gonna have infinitely many of them, infinitely many indecomposable representations. And um, in that case, like you might have like two representations that have the same dimension vector that, um, that actually are not isomorphic. Um, so I think, I think one answer is like, if you look at non-Dinkin quivers, then like actually the directions do matter. Um, oh, okay. I, I don't so know. That makes sense, that makes sense, thanks. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Um, how, like, how likely is it for a quiver to be a finite type? Like if I just um, drew a random drawing down on the piece of paper, would it be finite type or not? So it's finite type if and only if it's like one of these things. Um, so I would say like probability zero, basically. Oh, sorry, I misread that. Okay. Oh yeah, okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so thanks. I think these are all the root systems with which don't have double arrows or triple arrows, like all the simple ones. So I think that's correct. Yeah, B, C, F, or G. Um, do you know if it is like the fact that those have the double or triple arrows that stop it from being finite type? Mm. I don't think it's that because you can have like a quiver that's just like, like this, <laughs> that's not finite type. And it doesn't have any doubled arrows. It just has like an arrow of degree four. Yeah, I guess, but like, covered. This one isn't coming from a Dinkin diagram. So like if it yeah. is a Dinkin diagram already, like is it just the fact that those have double triple arrows that are stopping it? Do you know? That's a good question. I do not know. Okay. I, I do not know the answer to that. But um, I know that like there's sort of an expanded version of Gabriel's theorem, which talks about all the Dinkin diagrams. Um, so like this is like, this, one of the strongest things you can say, because it's like, these are all the finite type ones, but there is stuff you can say about Dinkin quivers that are not A, D, or E. Um, but I actually don't know what the statement of that is. Maybe is there, is there a notion of semi-simple that gives you the all the Dinkin dudes? Mm, yeah, I don't know the answer, yeah. to be honest. I don't know what the statement will be, but yeah, maybe. Um, Cool. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, I I, I have one. Um, yeah. So all, all of this looks awfully similar to the classification of semi-simple Lie algebras, right? Like all the drinking diagrams that you get there. I mean, here we just have like some of them. Uh, do, is is there any sort of relationship there, or is it just like an accident somehow? Um, that's also a great question. So. I mean, there's gotta be a relationship, but I can't, I don't know. I don't think it's an accident, I think. Um, but I don't have a lot of um, experience with like representations of the algebras and stuff. So I don't, I don't have a great answer right now other than like, I'm, I'm sure there's a, there's a relationship and it's all representation theory, but, but yeah. Okay, so I guess there's there's a few minutes left, so maybe I'll try to talk quickly about the path algebra. Um, so let me give some definitions here. So, okay, a path is is what you think it is. Um, a path is a sequence of arrows. Uh, let's see. Path is a sequence of arrows. So I'll say alpha one to alpha L. Uh, 
uh, such that then the tail of alpha i should be the source of alpha i plus one um, when that makes sense. So for one less than or equal to i less than or equal to l minus one. In other words, it's just like a path in a directed graph. Um, alpha one, alpha L. And we say that each node is associated to a path of length zero in your quiver. Um, and that's just a convention, but it also helps us sort of uh, turn the set of paths into an algebra. So what do I mean? I'm talking about the path algebra and the definition is we'll write it as CQ. So in this case, it's a C algebra. So this is a C algebra with basis, the set of paths. Um, and multiplication given by concatenation, multiplication. So I wrote an exercise on the bottom here. Um, the question is concatenation. The question is what is the multiplicative identity in this algebra? Um, so it's not like completely obvious what it should be just like when you first see the definition, but it, I think it's a good exercise to think about. Um, and in the meantime, I will give an example. So for example, if you have, so now we're back to talking about quivers that, that can have directed loops. Um, if you have this quiver, which is just a loop, so maybe I'll, I'll call the vertex E1 and I have like uh, an arrow Taney, called alpha. Yeah. I think I may have missed it, but uh, are these based at a point or are they just any path? No, Okay. any okay. path. Cool, thanks. Okay, yeah, I should clarify, I should clarify. Um, maybe I didn't say this. No, but I think product, I may have just missed it. Yeah, but there's something else I wanted to say that somehow oh, your, your question reminded me of. Very <laughs> so nice. product is equal to zero if concatenation doesn't make sense. Fantastic. And also to clarify, this is a non-commutative algebra, right? It matters which... Yep. Uh, yeah, good point. It's not commutative. Um, yeah, so product is equal to zero if concatenation doesn't make sense. So in this case, the set of paths for this loop quiver, the set of paths, well, we have this one that's just length zero. It's just the, um, the vertex. And then we have like alpha, and then we can go around alpha twice. So I'll write that as alpha squared. And you can just do that any number of times. And those are all different paths. And so in this case, you, you can get the this path algebra CQ is actually isomorphic to C adjoined X, um, the, the polynomial ring. And here's another example. So in this case, this is called A3 from like what we did before. Uh, this this uh, quiver with three, um, three nodes in a row. And just sort of writing out all the paths, um, you can make a multiplication table, which I did. And it's, not obvious what this algebra is, but it turns out that um, you you can show via like a pretty simple isomorphism that CQ is isomorphic to um, upper triangular three by three matrices. Upper triangular three by three matrices. So that is the path algebra. Um, and let's see, since there's only a few minutes left, maybe I'll say, okay, there's this, I mean, a pretty simple sort of uh, classification of when the path algebra is finite dimensional, but I'm just gonna skip that because I wanna get to the last slide, uh, which is the important part. Like, why do we care about the path algebra? Well, it turns out that if you look at like all representations of your quiver, just as quiver representations. Um, and you look at the representations of the path algebra, like as a C algebra. So I'm, I'm calling these two categories rep Q and rep CQ. Um, and these categories are equivalent. So in other words, uh, if we have a path algebra that we care about, well, 
we can study all of its representations. We know everything about it, it, the category of representations by looking at representations of the quiver that gives us that path algebra. Um, and now here's maybe a, an even more surprising theorem. Maybe that's not so surprising, but um, if A is any finite dimensional C algebra, uh, then the category rep A, so in other words, this is the category, this is like the set of all representations of A along with like morphisms between them and stuff. This category is equivalent to uh, rep of, and then I'll write this CQ mod I for some quiver Q and some two-sided ideal I. Some two-sided ideal I in CQ, where C CQ is again the path algebra. Um, and the term for this, this is why this was in my title. Um, it's called, A is, is called Morita equivalent to the, um, the algebra CQ mod I. Is, so what does that mean? Uh, yeah. Is Go rep ahead. A just A mod or is this yep. some other kind of rep? Okay. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I guess I could have used either one. Um, Sounds good. I don't know if this is like a standard notation, but somehow I just thought, oh, I'll just call it rep A. Yeah, it's just A, a mod. Um, so like modules over the, of the algebra A. Um, and I'll just repeat one more time what, what this actually means because it's, it's kind of significant. So if a, for any finite dimensional C algebra, uh, you can find a quiver and you know that the representations of that algebra can be studied by just studying representations of this some quotient of the path algebra of that quiver. Um, and maybe just one last thing is maybe you're concerned, okay, what, what does this quotient mean? Maybe it makes things way more complicated. Well, it turns out, I mean, most of the time, if you have, if you have some quiver, you have some two-sided ideal of the quiver, maybe, maybe like, I, I guess this won't happen all the time, but maybe my two-sided ideal of my path algebra is just generated by like the path alpha one, alpha two. Um, maybe this is my ideal. It's like generated by that path. Well, that means that any, any representation of the, of the path algebra mod that ideal, well, it's the same thing as a representation of my quiver. So like an assignment of, of like vector spaces, like, I don't know, C, A, C, B, C, C, um, where this composition of arrows has to be zero. So in other words, like uh, for, for most like well-behaved ideals of your path algebra, it, it just means we're looking at representations of your quiver where some composition of arrows has to be zero. Um, so yeah, I think that's most of what I wanted to say. I think it's a pretty surprising result. Um, and yeah, I hope that helps answer the question of sort of what are quivers and also maybe why are quivers. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. All right, everyone, let's thank Tani for the very informative talk. Any questions, quiverstions? Uh, I have a quick, quick yeah, I have a one of those. Quiver question, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned a couple slides ago about this uh, algebra of upper triangular matrices is the same as the... Jeff. Yeah, so this confused me because I feel like the algebra of upper triangular matrices should have infinitely many elements, but this has like seven or however many counting is. <laughs> yeah. Um, or is this... Oh, what do I, I want to say? It's like, it's like the uh, multiplication oh. table on a basis or something. I see now. Yep. All right, great. Everything makes sense to me. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, this, I think, would be confusing to me too if I hadn't like made this example. Um, so the point is that if you have like a, a finite dimensional C algebra, then you can like define the entire thing by like writing out a basis and then putting a writing a multiplication table for just that basis, and then like everything extends linearly. So mm -hmm. it's a good question. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Could you explain the 
the identity element thing. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around this path algebra. I'm not really good at yeah. algebra, so I wanted to, it's some help. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool, where was that? So what is a multiplicative identity? Um, Ooh, is it the sum over the constant paths? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah good guess. Um, so yeah, that's it's going to be the sum over i in q zero, or maybe I'll just I'll just say I'll just write it as like e one plus e two plus plus e n, um, and why is that? So like, say we have a quiver, call this like I'm calling the the constant pads e one, e two, and so on. Um, I don't know. I want to give some non-trivial example. When you say constant path, you mean uh, you just stay where you are, or or like you say you e two for example, you just stay at e two. Yeah. So in general, like a a path can either have like positive length, in which case like it should be like a sequence of um, some positive number of arrows, or it can just have zero length, in which case it's just like a vertex. Um, gotcha. Yeah, so for example, like if I consider the path that's like alpha one, alpha two, and I and I multiply it by like E1 plus E2 plus E3 plus E4, uh, I can multiply on either side and I should get the same thing. And it's uh, because, well, alpha one, alpha two times E1, um, well, that doesn't make sense as a composition because, um, or as a concatenation, because I go alpha one and then alpha two, and then I go back to E1, so it doesn't make sense. So I get zero. And then same thing with E2, I get zero. But with E3, I just get alpha one, alpha two. Um, and then with E4, it also doesn't make sense. So I just get alpha one, alpha two. And then the same thing should work if I do the multiplication in the other way. Gotcha. Um, Thanks. Yeah, good question. Uh, I have one question. Yeah. So is there a canonical way to write group algebra in, in, in the life? So can you go to the last slide? Yeah. So, I mean, is there a canonical way to write, let's say, group algebra? Or is there a way to represent uh, the usual representation theory in terms of uh, like quiver representation theory? Yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, it's totally a natural question and it's something that I maybe should have had an answer for, but I, I don't have an answer for that. Um, I suspect that actually, I honestly have no idea how this proof goes. So yeah. it could either be like a constructive proof, like, you know, start with a basis of your algebra and then like construct some quiver, or it could be like non-constructive. I suspect it's constructive and that there is a, there is a way to do it if you read the proof, but I don't have an answer, unfortunately, but it's a good question. Thank you. Um, a possibly related question that maybe someone who knows more algebra than me can see the answer to, but uh, we were musing about the possible relationship between uh, these um, quiver classification theorems and, uh, uh, and Lie algebra representations or uh, Lie algebra classifications. And maybe it's got to do somehow with this equivalence of rep q and rep cq maybe via the universal enveloping algebra of the lie algebra appearing as cq but that's the best i got maybe uh, that sparks a few ideas yeah it could be i don't know <laughs> but it's a it's a good question uh, i think the universal enveloping algebra is always infinite dimensional which might kind of put a stop in things there yeah that's true maybe you'd have to cut it down somehow if anything well it could be okay i mean like i i mean we we don't really care about like if you're talking about like just a connection between like oh well like representations of okay my, my point is what i want to say is that like this last theorem maybe like you can have rep, you can have a path algebra that that is infinite dimensional. That's like a simple, like the one I gave. Like the this one is, you know, infinite dimensional. Um, so that may not be a 
I don't know. It may not be a stop. It may not like be a hurdle to get over. So. Mm -hmm. Sorry, wait, I'm just looking at this chat now. Uh, you can realize a group rep as a quiver rep by taking a single vertex with an arrow for each group element. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that seems right. Um, oh, there's no composition of arrow in quiver, so it would be a special class of quiver. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think if you take a monoid like at, at a single point, that's usually what group presentation theory like relates to. But uh, like yeah. in quiver theory, we, we are specifically not composing arrows. So there's no meaning of, uh, so if you take a representation theory, if you go from vertex one to two to three, the, I, I believe from your definition, uh, like you do not have any kind of composition of the two maps, right? Yeah, I think this is like, this is like along the right lines though, because you do have this flexibility of being able to take this ideal, like mod out by this ideal. Yeah. So I think the point is like, if your group, maybe if your group is, yeah, if your group is finite, then you can just like put an arrow for each group element and then like mod out by the ideal that's generated by like all the relations between all the group elements. Um, and that should get you the right yeah. category. Yeah. That's yeah. sounds so good. Yeah, cool, that's awesome. I, I didn't think of that before. All right, any other questions or comments? I have one. Uh, it's not mathematical. Like historically, when did people start caring about quivers? Like in what context did this sort of yeah, arise? I, that's a good question. I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think like before Gabriel and Gabriel's theorem, which was like 1972, I think this didn't, this, there wasn't much theory about this. Like, I think it really started with like in 1972. So it's like relatively recent. Um, yeah, that's the best answer I have. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Anything else? All right, well, let's thank Tani again.